And Jesus is coming, you guys. You heard the gospel. Jesus is coming. Everybody look busy. <laughs> Do something, right? That's a popular saying because that's, a, um, uh, that's on bumper sticker. Jesus is coming. Look busy. Um, because that is a really popular way of talking about um, evangelism. People use it. You guys have probably seen the billboards, right? That say, the Lord is coming. Where are you going to be when he shows up? Ooh. Ooh, he's coming. You better be ready. And that, to me, seems like an, a unique way to fish for people. An odd way, maybe. I don't, has, any, has it resonated with you? God's coming. You better behave. Good. <laughs> I don't know if it has. I have a hard time with it. I think that's a very popular, very ever-present fishing technique that people use when they understand Jesus is like, it's time to fish for people. They're like, okay, let's tell them how much God's going to hit them if they don't pay attention. <sighs> that doesn't sound right. It actually doesn't sound at all like good news, which is the gospel, right? It actually sounds like very intimidating news. Something we should be concerned about. It, to me, sounds like the, the way I'm kind of uninstructed to raise, like, children. You, good behavior gets you good things. Bad behavior gets you bad things. Natural consequences, but let's be perfectly frank, my voice changes when there's bad things happening. And I bet you you're, I'm not alone in that. Um, but you learn as, you're, as a parent you can't just punish someone better. <laughs> Sometimes kids got to learn. Sometimes that happens. And I don't know if that technique of intimidation and threats is one that really lands. So I'm stuck with this reading because I think faith is way more nuanced than doing good gets you stuff. I think our faith is very versed and nuanced and sensitive. I don't think faith is like that. But I would say it's very popular that mainstream Christianity is fixated on uh, what only what I describe as the end result, salvation. There's books even written about it. The end of days, right? This is what it'll look like. Some even prognosticate when it'll happen. It'll happen on this date. It'll happen right now. You got to be ready. We're in the end days. We're in this. I'm like, that's a lot of attention. In fact, even early disciples were concerned about that because Jesus died, was resurrected. He went up into the clouds and they're like, when he comes back, we got to be ready. And they were thinking Jesus would come back very soon. In fact, we got a reading today. Why are you so fixated on the end? That's judgment. That's the end of days. It's, why are you doing that? And I think there's some wisdom there. But I think that urgency, that fear, that anxiety of what's coming has affected all of us. Will we be punished or will we be saved? Are we sheep or are we goats? Are we going to be, like in the parable said, at this party but left out? Ooh, that's like a knife in our gut, right? That's something kids say. That was what I experienced. Maybe you experienced the same thing. You can't come to my birthday party. What a threat. You don't want that. You want to go to the party. And I think this parable makes us wonder then, are we going to be let in? Are we going to be late? Is the Lord going to say, I don't know you and not let us in? But I wonder if that's looking at the parable, not in the wrong light, but really fixated, focused on a character in the story that maybe we shouldn't be so fixated and focused on. Um, a lot of us are thinking about the bridesmaids because they're the main character of this story. They're talked about the most. But I think a lot of us are focused on the bridesmaids because that's us. We're obviously them. So what do they do? He's telling us something about the kingdom. What are we supposed to do? But I say, again, like I said a while ago about the parables, which one of them is Jesus? I would like to do some gymnastics theologically and try to determine Jesus as somebody else, but he's the bridegroom. He's coming to the party. That's pretty clear. What is the bridegroom doing? The bridegroom, are we ready for this little bit of attention? Maybe it was overlooked. The bridegroom isn't there. Why? Why is the bridegroom not there? Because he has been delayed. He's been delayed. He's not there yet. A lot of us are fixated on when, but I think a really big attention needs to be on he is not there yet. He's coming. There's no debate about that. He's showing up. 
He's going to be there. The party's going to get started. There's going to be a celebration for the bridegroom and the bride. It's going to be a great day. But currently, he is delayed. I think the preoccupation with when he will arrive might be the wrong fixation. Instead, what does it mean the bridegroom is coming? No question about it. He's coming, but in the meantime, he is delayed. I think we sometimes focus on the then instead of remembering that fact. I want to make very clear that this parable to me is all about how now matters. Now matters. Now is not something to overlook. Now is not something to care less about in anticipation of this great party to come. And I'll give you an example of somebody who's too fixated on the then, the the later. Um, This was a skit that I heard, and I've heard it a few times, and I love it to death. A person dies, and we know this, the, the famous joke, someone goes up to the pearly gates, and they go through their life, and he dies, and he gets up there, and the angel's right there with the book, goes, whoa, you did great. And he goes, oh, what am I doing here? I did not expect to be here so soon. I'm only like 35 years old. And they go, I know a little earlier than expected, I'm sure, but I do want to reiterate, wow, good job. You did fantastic. Are you ready to hear what you did? And he goes, I get, I, I guess, uh, yeah, go ahead. He goes, great. Okay. So you have scored, are you ready? 7,345 out of 128,312. <laughs> great, right? And he goes, what, what are you talking about? And he goes, what do you mean? That's, You've done great. Your life's worked. 7,345 times is how many times you beat your computer at solitaire. Think about that. And he goes, oh, solitaire. And he goes, you know, king and queen, solitaire. You've played it like all the time. And he goes, oh, well, I thought this would be more about my life's work. He goes, yeah, your life's work, solitaire. And he goes, solitaire was not my life's work. And he goes, wasn't it though? It seemed like that's what you were doing. I mean, you kept coming back to this. You played it a lot. We thought there was some sort of spiritual ecstasy you got from seeing the cards flitter all over. He goes, no, no, I did other stuff. He goes, oh, well, um, yeah, that's what it is. He goes, I just played that game to pass the time. And he goes, well, congrats again. Time passed. You did it. Good job. That joke to me resonated so much with me because of that idea that I was just doing that to pass the time. Why do we have these things to pass time? I would wonder how many of us are consumed with things that just simply pass the time. We're waiting for a then and a there. We're waiting for the next thing. I I know as a parent, it's like when they get out of diapers, when they go to school, or when they do this, or when that. There's, There's a lot of when this happens, then this. What about now? Because... Theologically, the bridegroom is coming. He's just delayed. Now matters. Now counts for something. To quote the Reverend Dr. Rick Barger, former president of Trinity Lutheran Seminary, I'll put on my thick Georgia accent, today is not a dress rehearsal. (laughs) I'm like, whoa! I love that idea. Because I too would say, now matters. Why am I fixated on this city of gold, these roads and streets paved in gold? One fine morning when this life is over. I love that song, to be fair, but it talks about the world as being garbage. From these prison walls I'll fly. Whoa. Earth stinks. Your time here sounds miserable. Is that God's hope that right now stink out loud? No. I shouldn't be preoccupied entirely with my salvation, what will happen at the end when honestly right now someone is hungry. That's a kind of hell I don't know and a kind of hell I don't want others to experience. Why should I be preoccupied with streets of gold when there are kids around the world who don't get an education? have no access to education, clean drinking water, 
people are suffering and I'm preoccupied with the then and there as if that's supposed to be my priority. No, this is my priority. My neighbors are my priority because the sun is coming. He's just delayed. Now matters. Today is not a dress rehearsal. It's something to think about. Because if, if you're maybe in the camp that, hey, one day Jesus is going to show up, what's it all matter? Then I would ask, which one of you have pulled your children out of school? No more school. Who needs it? It doesn't happen. Because we know it matters. We know it's good. We know it's important that our kids have an education. I think it's important that we're doing the work now of keeping our lamps trimmed. Because in that story, we have the urgency and anxiety of the people that don't have enough oil. I think the work then is how do we keep our lamps filled? How do we live now knowing that Jesus is coming? Now matters. Keeping our lamps trimmed is about keeping our lamps burning. I would argue that there's a lot of that happening in churches, right? Uh, Taft Elementary. Do we have some volunteers who volunteer at Taft here? Yes. Every time you go there and help a child with their reading. Every time you spend time with children, let them know they're not by themselves. They have the support of somebody else who loves them and wants them to succeed. I want you to know you're bringing your oil to the table to let that light burn. Good work. That means now matters. Every time you help somebody who's in need, you add a little oil. You bring oil to the table. You burn that oil. You get that light shine. Every time, you guys may not know this. You guys, I hope you understand worship isn't just obligational. You are receiving something at this table. Consider it oil. It's to keep that lamp burning. When you come here and say, I'm not God. I don't know what's the answer to everything, but I do know the body of Christ is present here. And as hard as that could be to live in community sometimes, We are better for it. And that is taking our lamps and keeping them trimmed. That's providing oil. That's receiving oil. That's what's happening when you are here. Every time you come here, every time you serve your neighbor, you are bringing the oil. The groom is delayed. But that's not really the point, right? The point is that now means something. He'll get here when he gets here. Determining when he gets here is not part of your job. I want you to know as a pastor, as great of insights we have about the end of days, there are no extra points for determining when Jesus shows up. Just so you're all aware. I will not, there's no extra points. What matters is today. What matters is that today isn't a dress rehearsal. Instead, today we're going to focus on what's good, on keeping our lamp lit, on bringing our oil to the table, on living as Jesus instructed, which is in daring confidence. Though we cannot solve all of the world's problems, it can be so intimidating, but you can solve a problem that's right here, which is if someone is hungry, we have the ability to feed them. If someone needs clothes, we have the ability to provide it. If someone is in need of help, you have that ability. And every time you do that, you are burning that light. You are keeping that lamp lit. Because today counts. This is the day. This one is a holy day. This is the day the Lord has made. And we're going to rejoice. We're going to be glad in it. We're going to cry. We're going to struggle. But today counts. And for that... I am so grateful for how we mean to honor today. Amen.